Welcome to the OnScript podcast, your home for world-class conversations on scripture and theology, where you get to meet some of the best in the field. Visit us at onscript.study. Say hello on Twitter at OnScript Podcast and stop by our Facebook page at facebook.com slash OnScript. Hello, friends. Welcome to OnScript. This is Amy Brown Hughes, a co-host for the podcast with Matt Lynch, Matt Bates, Aaron Heim, Drew Johnson, Chris Tilling, and Jules Martinez Olivieri. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Ted Smith, the Charles Howard Candler Professor of Divinity and Associate Dean of Faculty at Emory's Candler School of Theology. He also serves as Director of Theological Education Between the Times, a project that gathers diverse groups of people to think together about the meanings and purposes of theological education. He is the editor of the companion series, Theological Education Between the Times, published by our friends at Erdman's which includes books like After Whiteness by Willie James Jennings, Renewing the, S- the Church by the Spirit by, by Amos Young, Notes of a Native Daughter by Carrie Day, and the book we'll be discussing today. He is on the editorial boards of various journals and is ordained to ministry in the Presbyterian Church USA. Ted works at the intersections of practical and political theology and is the author of three books, Weird John Brown by Stanford and The New Measures, Cambridge, And today we'll be talking about his newest book out this year, published in Erdman's Theological Education Between the Times series called The End of Theological Education. Yes, I know. An ominous title if there ever was one. When I saw this book, I knew I had to read it, and I'm so glad I did. Welcome, Ted. Thanks so much, Amy. I'm glad to be here. Could you start us off today by talking about what your journey into theology looked like? Is there a moment or two that stands out as being particularly formative? Um, I'm also interested in this sort of um, practical political theology intersection. So if you could talk about that too, that'd be great. Well, I think um, in the in the book, I describe a network of voluntary associations. And I'm speaking from the inside as I talk about that. I was raised in uh, a deep network of voluntary associations, not only my home congregation, which my parents and grandparents and great-grandparents and as back far back as we could remember had all been part of it, um, but also things like Junior League and Rotary and political parties and just this dense associational network was uh, really the soil in which I grew up in the Midwest. And uh, you know the the core virtue of that world is to do good and make a difference, to make the world more like God wants it to be. So that's what I was raised to do. That's and I you know I'm a true believer in that. I kind of took that all the way in. And so I thought I would either do that through uh, work in the church or work in the political sphere. Um, and there was nothing like an internship in Washington, D.C. to confirm my call to the church. Uh, <laughs> it was it was strong and clear, but it wasn't just a push. It was also a pull. I was doing a lot of activism uh, around housing issues with church folk. And um, it was not only that we were able to be really effective, but it was also uh, that I loved the people I was working with. And, uh, and it I felt like uh, God was present in the work, and those were profound things. So that's what drew me to the church uh, and to theology. As far as the doing both practical and political theology, I think uh, there's a lot of sources of that. An intellectual source for me, uh, Stanley Hauerwas was an important undergrad teacher of mine, and so to think about the church as itself a political entity. Uh, or it's the way the church is as a as a work of politics. I wanted to really carry that insight into practical theology. So, um, so to think about the way, and that was so energizing for me when I was a pastor, to see that the the daily stuff of church life is already political, and it's not it's not like politics only happens when we're speaking to the town board or the city council or the governor or something like that. But the politics are there in the way that we preach. They're there in the way that we celebrate the sacraments. So I think that was just a kind of, that was shaping up my imagination early on and then was confirmed by my work in 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 a congregational ministry setting. So I've just carried that forward. Yeah, thank you. So normally my first question is something along the lines of why did you write this book? 
In this case, the why is probably just a bit too big for one question. So we're going to back up a bit and take this kind of step by step. Um, Because our listeners are kind of all over the map. Uh, We have people who are in seminary, who are in, who are teaching theology, who are uh, doing kind of on the academic side and then we or in the process of. And then we have a lot of listeners who are in active ministry or who are um, who listen to this podcast because, you know, they might not have time to read the books, but they want to hear about them and they want to kind of have those conversations. And then we have a lot of others who are just interested because the topics are you know, so we're kind of all over the place. Um, and I love that because it gives us the opportunity to kind of break down some of the things that we work through. So um, I'm, you know, hearing, you know, the kind of the end of theological education can kind of seem. So I, I, I think I want to work on the thinking about the scope of this book a little bit because I think it'll really help. So the education, the end of theological education is not merely about why numbers at seminaries are declining, right? It's much more. So would you define what the phrase theological education encompasses in this book? Sure. A big part of the argument of the book, um, but really um, it's a it's an argument and a kind of embodiment of the whole theological education between the times project, is that theological education is just much bigger, deeper, older, more far-reaching than uh, what happens in seminaries that are graduate and professional schools. Um, And it's more than just the training of clergy. Um, And part of the uh, work of theological education between the times as a project has been to surface voices like of Hispanic Bible Institutes or of City Seminary in New York or of monastic traditions that have always known this, have always known that theological education is more than the training of clergy um, and less than the training of clergy. It's, it's, it's something that happens uh, otherwise. So part of it is just to get to that more expansive uh, sense of what theological education can be. And to me, what, what, it, what it is at its heart, it's a theological education is coming into a saving, transforming knowledge of God. It's yeah. being known even as we are known. Um, and that's not something that we would restrict to clergy, I, I don't think. Um, that's something that we want for all people. Yes. As for why I got into the book, um, I, a lot of it was from my being part of uh, first Vanderbilt Divinity School mm-hmm. and now here at Candler, but then also just moving in uh, the circles of seminaries and divinity schools, theology schools across the country and hearing the concern about uh, numerical decline. And then what what really uh, drove the project or why this whole, not just the book, but why the whole project got started was every time I felt like I heard people thinking about uh, the decline in numbers and what it meant and what we needed to do, it felt like a managerial language would take over. Um, so a kind of managerialism. And uh, theology seemed to have left the building, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. I was really frustrated by those conversations. I was frustrated by their analysis of the problem. I was frustrated by their suggestions for what we uh, might do going forward. Um, And so I really wanted to try to open up space for a different kind of conversation. And that's, that's what the project has been from the beginning, is trying to invite really richly diverse groups of people Um, from beyond uh, ATS schools, like the whole scope of theological education, to invite richly diverse groups of people into critical and theological reflection on the meanings and purposes of theological education. That's what we're trying to do. Yes. So in your first chapter, you give a history of sorts of the American relationship Mm. with institutions. This was, a lot of it was stuff I knew but hadn't put together before. It was it's sort of, you know, kind of in, when you're in the water, you, you can see certain things, <laughs> Yeah. right? Yeah. But then when somebody points it out and shows you the whole scope, you're like, oh, yes, yeah, like I'm in it, but now I see the sort of the bigger thing. Can Could you give us a, a, a primer on the, sh- the shift from standing orders to voluntary associations or societies and what this has meant for churches, parachurch organizations, and those going into ministry? Sure. Well, the, the, the book, the whole book is structured by a kind of threefold historical narrative, three periods. 
And, you know, the, all the usual disclaimers need to apply and with extra effect that um, such periodizations are always wrong. They <laughs> always obscure um, things that they're trying to describe. Um, but, I, but here, uh, you know, I'm with Adorno who says it's not like you can work without such a scheme. We're always using such schemes. So what we need to do is to try to design ones that will fail in interesting and revelatory ways. <laughs> so that's that's what I've tried to do. Uh, but with those disclaimers present, here I I do offer a kind of rough periodization of a time from the European settlement of North America until roughly the revolution and the early national period. So that's that's a long time yeah. actually, and that's a time that I I call a time of standing orders, and then from the early national period until um, the long 60s, I think of that as a time of voluntary associations. And then now we're in, in another kind of cusp time, I think, when that age uh, where it structures the social imaginary, that social imaginary of voluntary associations is unraveling. And what we're seeing emerge is a kind of social imaginary that is formed by, that has authentic individuals at the center. So standing orders to voluntary associations to authentic individuals. That first transition that you name is from standing orders to voluntary associations, and I think it happened, you know, over it happened over the course of, of decades, but especially in that early national period, um, the standing orders were especially time. Uh, and borrow that phrase from uh, Connecticut in particular had a had a standing order in which. Um, you know, you didn't really have a differentiation of spheres. You didn't have a pure differentiation of the political, the economic, and the ecclesial. All of those spheres uh, were together. They were tightly interconnected. And so there was just one mode of education for that. You just, you know, you just went to Yale and you all studied the same thing. And then you ruled these different sectors and you could move pretty seamlessly between them because um, because they weren't really that different, right? And, um, and you know, a, a key signal of that was the uh, was the role that the church played in society, and because it had a public role and and almost um, wasn't you know differentiated from the state in the same way. But and and a hallmark of that is that it was funded by taxes, right? So that's that's that standing order, that set of standing orders. What happens with the rise of voluntary associations? Is that with you get progressive disestablishment of the church? Uh, you get that in Massachusetts, you get it in Connecticut, you get it in Virginia, um, but especially you get it uh, nationally. In the federal constitution, um, there's no way you could have a national church in this new reality because you've got Episcopalians in Virginia, you've got Congregationalists in New England. It's just not going to happen. And you've also got um, increasing pluralism on the ground because of settlement patterns and land acquisition patterns. And you've got revivals that are creating more than one church in the same town. So all these things are undoing the standing orders. And I think uh, it's easy to forget just how deep this disruption was um, and how hard it was to innovate new forms of church life. So uh, by one count in 1776, just 17% of Americans belong to churches, just 17%. Um, and I think that's because the churches were still wedded to this standing order moment. They hadn't made a transition, but the social imaginary had moved on. And so it no longer made sense to go to a standing order church. It didn't feel right. It didn't speak to people. Um, it didn't fit with their values or the other parts of their lives. So what happens in that early national period is that church leaders um, and leaders of other kinds of non uh, uh, non governmental organizations, voluntary associations, they innovate this new structure of the voluntary association, and this is what Tocqueville sees when he comes to the U.S. He's expecting anarchy, right? How can you have any sort of social order if the uh, church and state have been pried apart, and you've got this democratization? And instead, what he sees is a remarkable order. Um, and one that is uh, that is all organized in these voluntary societies, and then the seminary emerges um, as as the kind of hub of that whole network of of voluntary associations. Uh, Lyman Beecher, who's the president of Lane Theological Seminary uh, in Cincinnati, 
describes how the seminary educates not just the pastors, but also the leaders of voluntary associations for mission, for Bible tract publication, for uh, other kinds of tract publication, journalism, for abolitionist movements, for revival movements, for temperance movements. The whole network of associations to him flows through and it, uh, the leaders are trained by the seminary. So that's the role that the seminary moves into in the United States is at the hub of this network of voluntary associations. And it offers a way um, to use the language of professionalization, where kind of the the almost the accrediting of this position of we need people that have some kind of credibility, some kind of um, something <laughs> that allows because you know leadership is a, like some kind of leadership, some kind of because recognizing that. This, these voluntary associations are important to public life, to personal life, and needing people who have some kind of credentials um, to be able to fulfill these positions. So you have a very helpful section in this whole area of kind of how profession of how um, ministers become kind of a, pro a professional sort of category. Yeah, yeah, and in many ways, uh, ministers opened up the space into which uh, attorneys and physicians and later others would move. Um, it was really uh, the, the clergy and the physicians who were there as the kind of vanguard of opening up a space for a true professional in the US. And you can see that in some ways in the way that uh, education functions, it, it gives you a set of credentials, but it's also the way ordination functions. Ordination, like the way you introduced me, it becomes a kind of professional credential that moves around with a person in the same way that an MD would move around with a person. Whereas under the standing order, if you were the pastor of some town, um, it was because you were called to that place, you were elected to that place, and your credentials didn't necessarily transfer, right? Um, you were of that place. But the professional, uh, the credentials are invested in the individual who then can move around. And so that's what, uh, that's what the seminary arose to produce. Fascinating. So it's a common discussion in many circles in the U.S. and not just Christian ones to talk about the social, religious and political norm of prioritizing the individual over the communal. Like talking about how mm. we're very individualistic. <laughs> we need to be more communal. Like I hear that in lots of different ways and spaces. Right. And thinking about our kind of uh, epidemic of loneliness and isolation and kind of ways tr people are trying to think process through that. So in Christian circles, there are also various narratives about the decline in church attendance and the rise of those who designate themselves as religiously un unaffiliated, the so-called nuns. So as you know, in chapter two, though, there's a lot more going on here than a normative individualism or the decline of Christianity in America. And you, you spend some time on diagnosis in this chapter. So that's kind of where I want to begin. I'm going to just read a quote here. Uh, you say, we are in the midst of an unraveling as significant as the one that unknotted the standing orders and created the conditions in which networks of voluntary associations could be knitted together. The changes are not from more religion to less, but from one dominant way of imagining the relationship, relationships of individuals, institutions, the state and God to something else. And you have actually an ellipsis there. <laughs> like to uh, <laughs> something else, right? That's our undefined space. So I'm going to come yeah. back to the unraveling bit in a moment. And, but I want to talk a little bit about this emerging relational structure you gesture toward here. You call this process individualization, uh, the drive to curate ourselves, to choose into structures and webs of relationship in new ways, where, as you say, we are connected, first of all, by our common formation as particular kinds of selves. And I think we, we all have sort of uh, an understanding of this. I mean, it's oftentimes kind of re reductively discussed as like the Instagram generation, right? Curating ourselves for social media or something. Like there's kind of specific points where this comes up. But um, I think what you're offering here is something much broader um, and also deeper at the same time to help us process what is actually happening here. We've been talking a lot about symptoms um, and you're kind of trying to get underneath that. So would you explain what you mean by individualization and how these processes are changing everything? 
Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a big question, <laughs> a big set of questions. I, I use language of uh, individualization rather than individualism because I want to stress that what we're seeing here is not um, just a belief system like uh, Catholicism or communism or individualism uh, that like that we would hold uh, some kind of value, high value of the individual as our belief system. That is the language that a lot of uh, critics of individualism have used. And here I think especially of uh, Robert Bella and the fantastic team that uh, produced Habits of the Heart. And I do think they were on to a lot in that book, but they describe individualism as a kind of worldview that people have. I instead want to use language of individualization to describe not a worldview, but a social process or a set of social processes that happen to us whether we believe in them or not. Um, and I think these social processes are really powerful. I'm borrowing the term here from Ulrich Beck, a German sociologist, um, and but there's also a lot of analysis from the later Foucault and from Wendy Brown, uh, from Berkeley, that are all kind of flowing into this um, analysis of what's happening with late modern selves. Um, but I think that the, the social processes of individualization are wide ranging and we, we know them in our own lives. They're things like moving from a defined benefit pension plan in which all of us kind of share in this pension plan together to a 401k or a you know, where you're on your own. Um, and if you manage it well, then you're going to thrive. And if you don't, then uh, you're going to be poor and it's your fault. Um, so that's that's a pretty profound individualization that's happened. I think you see it in public schooling with the rise of a desire for school choice. And even within schools, uh, you've got individualized instruction plans and this kind of hyper... There's, public school used to be this place where if it was cruel or it was... But whatever, it was going to form you you know, all in the same way, it, like aspired to stamp a commonality. And that that ethos is gone, I would say, from education. Now it's about the individual flourishing of individual children. And that's something that it's not just uh, a belief system that they have. This is the this is the world that's being drilled into them uh, and the way, way in which they're being formed. Uh, you could also uh, think about the gig, the rise of the gig economy, where an individual isn't really part of a corporation. They're just doing their own hustle. And uh, so you see it across, and you can see it in the uh, collapse of political parties and the rise of charismatic individuals who kind of displace the party in some way. Um, anyway, could go on and on with examples of these, but what I want to say is that they're really large social processes. Now, if they are acting on us, instead of things that we would believe, right? Then I think we would expect to see the strongest effects of individualization on the people who have the least resources to resist it. So then you would see individualization happening most with people who are already marginalized because of their race or because of poverty or because of their gender or sexuality or their immigration status. And that is exactly what we see. The caricature of uh, nuns that uh, I had kind of picked up by osmosis before I really started studying it was, it was like white yuppies at brunch, who, you know, who would rather, or soccer parents who wanted to, you know, who were doing things other than church with their disposable leisure time. Um, and sure, there is some of that, but if you look uh, at the, Ryan Burge, the sociologist, uh, has done great work on this. If you look at who's actually part of congregations now, you're much more likely to be a part of congregation if you're in the upper quartile of American income. And the people who are least likely are the people in the bottom quartile. That's relatively new, actually, in the last 50 years. Um, but it's happened with these processes of individualization. The same thing with the deaths of despair that Case and Deaton note. These are happening disproportionately to the poorest people. That's who get individualized in the harshest, starkest ways kind of left out there uh, on their own. So just to see these material processes, um, it changes the way we diagnose what's happening with individualization. Um, we're not going to be able to scold people back into the Kiwanis Club or the, you know, the bowling league or uh, First United Methodist Church of Doraville. 
because it's not just in our heads. It's not just a belief system. It's these powerful uh, social currents. And I think that was really one of the great turning points in this book for me yeah. was when I saw that, when I really took it to heart, and then I saw my students in a new way, and I saw their struggles with individualization um, and what, how they were trying to cope with that. I saw it with fresh eyes and frankly, with much more compassion um, to see this as a really difficult spot in which we are. So it's not, it's not just a vice, um, a private vice that we could correct with better thinking or if the church gave a better narrative, something like that. Um, but these are profound social changes um, that are affecting us all and are affecting the most vulnerable uh, the most acutely. Yeah, that was a particular moment. I, 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 I when I write, I write in books. Um, I know other people don't, but I write in books. And in that section where you talk about how, is this, so there's a stereotype, right? Well, of um, that the poor go to church and the wealthy with their disposable income don't. And, <laughs> and to realize that it's actually the opposite. It's exactly the opposite. Floored me. Right. Because um, I, I, and I realized that I didn't have any data to back up <laughs> my assumption. Um, and so that was particularly important to me. And I, I've been thinking about, you know, looking at our students with the, um, use the language later of how our students are hacking curricula. Yeah. And, and I've, I've used, that has now a phrase I use because they're trying, and there's a lot of reasons they do this, not just for their own particular pathway that is specific to them, but also because, you know, they can't spend all the time in the world <laughs> going to school and they're, they're also working a job and they're, um, and they're they're supporting family. Um, they might be the person who's taking care of their grandparent at home. I mean, there's just there's all sorts of things happening right. that didn't used to be the case for students right. going to college. They're in a really different structural economy now. Yeah, I, to to bring it home to seminary, uh, one of the ways there, and you can this is one of the most acute cases of individualization. Seminary used to overwhelmingly be paid for by the church, right? You didn't go into debt to go to seminary. Maybe your, con you know, your, it didn't cost that much, but then your congregation gave you a little money. The denomination heavily subsidized the school. All these things kind of came together, um, and there was a community. The vol, the network of voluntary associations, paid for the individual, paid for that, paid for theological education. That's not the way it is now. Now you're on your own. Um, you're this individualized person who mostly has a deal with the school for a financial aid package um, and then with a third party lender who's lending to you as an individual. So it's one of the places we see individualization. And with the care for families, we see this too as kind of extended kinship networks. Um, what happens with individualization is we we move, right? We move for the better job. We move for this. We, at, we move to survive, um, but that breaks up these kinship networks that used to provide all kinds of informal care. Um, yeah. So, and again, uh, if you if you have resources, then you can uh, you can pay other people to do that kind of work, and then that lets you have time to go to the PTA. Um, and if you don't, uh, then it, it's just overwhelming. And then your voice isn't there, right? So we're missing. Yeah. We're missing voices in pretty much every level of society because people are having to work three jobs and stay home with their kids. And um, just think about um, just kind of the, the loss that that we're kind of experiencing there. And I, you know, this whole time I think uh, I, it comes back to me. Sort of the I'm going to have to name a Taylor Swift song here. You're on your own, kid, and you always have been. Like there's just sort yeah. of a sense that. Um, this fundamental thing that I have to make my way in the world. And if I get sick, I have to set up a GoFundMe. <laughs> and if I, you know, I have to figure out all these things on my own. And the weight of that is so astounding. Um, and I just think as a professor or as pastors or anyone who's in positions where they're kind of working with people who are are being formed, <laughs> who are becoming, um, that's the reflex of compassion in this space as opposed to, you know, assigning things to laziness because they're falling asleep in class. Well, maybe it's because they're working a third shift job, right? Like there's even how we interpret actions are, have to be different um, as we understand uh, what is actually happening with the structure of how relationships and institutions work now. And if we don't respond to that, 
um, you know, what does our formation look like? And one of the you, you mentioned this a moment ago about uh, about debt. Uh, one of the things that hit me in the gut was when you talked about how the primary one of the primary ways that that um, people are being formed who go to our schools is being formed as debtors and not in like the nice Christian sense, like, <laughs> like <laughs> forgive us our debts, like forgive us yeah, our debts, but no. like as in debt <laughs> Uh, to credit cards, to uh, student loans, to uh, that this is formational for how we make decisions in our lives, putting off um, having families or having, you know, moving into neighborhoods that we want to be in. I mean, it it affects everything and it's formational. Um, So that is another space. I was like, oh, dear. (laughs) 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 We're pretty. Yeah. We're participating in a system that is uh, that we're going to fight against. Oh, goodness. Let's go back to that um, unraveling piece of a voluntary association. So I will say that there was a lot in this book that resonated with me and was so helpful in processing the challenging times that we find ourselves in. And your chapter on the unraveling was definitely one of those. So my question here is pretty general. So take it in any direction you want. What is unraveling and why? I think the main thing that's unraveling is the social imaginary. And I'm, I'm borrowing that phrase from Charles Taylor. Uh, there's a lot of Charles Taylor under the hood in this book. Um, but uh, that what's unraveling is a social imaginary in which the voluntary association um, is charged with meaning and can give purpose and direction to a life and establish a meaningful kind of community. Um, and so those strong institutions that are also then connected to a sense of national purpose, right? That's There's no way to separate the way that network of voluntary associations emerged in America from a sense of a sacred mission of the nation. Um, that's that's why they had the charge they did that the as as Beecher said so clearly you know the voluntary associations are going to win the continent uh, for Christ with for a Protestant American white Christ and then America's going to win the world uh, for, and bring in the millennium so that and even if even if that got secularized a bit you still hear that sense of a sacred national mission and the voluntary association whether it's the Boy Scouts or whether it's you know the Baptist Church; they're integrated into that uh, sacred mission. That's what's unraveling—a uh, sense that that is so meaningful, so powerful. Um, so it's unraveling materially. I talked about some of the ways in which that's happening. Um, you know, like uh, the individuals have to pay for their own theological education. That kind of go on and on. It's also unraveling as a as there's a there's an uh, ideational level at which it's unraveling. I think here uh, of my father, who's a committed, he's an engineer, he's not clergy, but a deeply devout and committed Presbyterian layman. And for him, uh, as for generations of my family, service on a committee at the church is, this is discipleship, right? Uh, and so, and it can be the finance committee, the building and grounds committee, the personnel committee. It doesn't matter, the ushers committee. In some way, it doesn't matter. It's all super meaningful because that association of the church, that institution is charged with meaning. So if you're sustaining that institution, then you're doing the Lord's work, right? And it gives meaning to your life. It bonds you with the people around you. So that's a mindset uh, from that generation and from that that world. But that mindset is not there anymore. Uh, It's unraveling even with people who go to church and are, or people who are profoundly committed to a, maybe a fairly orthodox Christianity, right? But they don't find serving on the finance committee super meaningful anymore. Um, and that's because what's unraveled is the social imaginary in which the institution played that kind of role. So I think this is one way in which mega churches have uh, already adapted to this in many ways. They don't ask you to sustain the institution for the most part. Um, and I think it's a mainline caricature of them to say that that turns it into consumer Christianity, um, because what what at least a you know a, let's take the best case scenario in each case. But if somebody's a devoted member of a small group, then they're still going. They're they're engaged in Bible study. They're praying for people in their small group. They're engaged in service with their small group. It is not obvious to me 
that serving on the Building and Grounds Committee is uh, less commercialized and closer to discipleship of Jesus than that kind of small group meeting, right? Uh, so it's to push these two worlds against each other and kind of let each of the social imaginaries have their have their own uh, integrity. So there's a lot. I'm sure you know our listeners' minds are spinning about all the things <laughs> that they kind of seeing that unraveling. So for our listeners who are probably starting to tap into concerns they already have and potentially adding new ones, would you read uh, what you say on page 97? So let me let me take it at the beginning of the paragraph. Sure. Instead of decline, uh, the book is the book is theologically uh, dead set against narratives of both progress and decline. I see, I'm, I see that theology of history as a bad reading of the way in which the kingdom of God intersects with history. But And I also think they're empirically dubious. Um, so we that could be another conversation, but no progress, no decline in this book. This uh, historical theologian says amen. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I, so does Augustine. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, but those narratives of decline are just everywhere right now. Um, and then, and uh, you know, I think in certain parts of Silicon Valley, you might, and other little, there are small sectors where you'll get the narratives of progress that are everywhere. But mostly these days, the narratives of decline are fashionable and um, and they can seem like sophistication, um, but they're not. All right. So instead of decline, uh, I'm reading from the book now, I see this time between the times as one of unraveling. The consolidations of the age of voluntary associations are coming undone. Space is opening between the institutions, individuals, and ideals once woven so tightly together. Not just with one another, but with the larger project of a white Christian America. There is a judgment in this unraveling, as when God promised to unravel the plans of the Egyptians in the book of Isaiah. And well, all I mean here is to say that when you, when you expose hear why this was such a meaningful world, you can, you feel a certain ambivalence about it, right? There is a judgment of God on this. Um, if if why it was so meaningful was because of that millennialist vision that Beecher had with a white Christian America at the center, um, you know, I, uh, there's judgment in just the revelation of what's really driving the, 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 the bus here. So there's judgment in this unraveling. There are also, also losses worthy of lament. And I want to stress that lament. I do not celebrate the passing of this order. There is real material suffering that is happening with this. There is a, going back to the book, there is a kind of revelation like the unraveling of a riddle or a mystery, a disclosure, an apocalypsis. And there are new fragile possibilities. Picked apart from one another, individual threads can't carry as much weight as they did when they were woven together, but they endure. Even now, threads of the love of learning and the desire for God are available to be woven together with other threads into a fallible, faithful pattern. A time of unraveling can feel like the end of the world. It can be a time for grief, penitence, and discernment, but it's not a time for despair. Yes. So why is it not a time to despair? Uh, because God longs to be known. And as long as God longs to be known, and, and God longs to be known because knowing and being known is uh, essential to love. And as long as God longs to be known, there will be theological education. Um, so that's why there's... I mean, yeah. And, and when our hope is in, in God, right? And the God who sustains yeah. us, then... Um, there will there will always be old old orders that pass away. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there will always be new things, but there's always also consistency and continuity um where where God doesn't throw out things, um, but repurposes, reshapes, reforms, brings out the new. So when I read this section of your book, I kept thinking about Natalie Carnes's work on iconoclasm. And the destruction of images and idols in um, her book, Images Presence, or um, a Christological Reflection on Iconography and Iconophilia. She argues that iconoclasm is at the heart of our understanding of what happened on the cross, where Christ breaks brokenness mm -hmm. and refuses to let violence be determinative. 
And that breaking means that Christ is present, even to rivenness itself or brokenness itself. Or we might say unraveling. Like this isn't like God abandoning us or like, you know. So when you're saying judgment, that's not, um, I think we might immediately think that that's God scolding us. <laughs> Um, but it's actually a space of, of, of actually deep presence of God where yeah. and where the idolatrous images of God that we've con- concocted over the years out of ambition or greed or grasping for power. This is an opportunity and a call for them to be torn down and that God is there. And this chapter was particularly helpful for me because sometimes unraveling is the work of the Holy Spirit. And it's painful and potentially destructive in the sense of tearing down idols or breaking down high places, but it's also necessary. So this connection was made even clearer for me when you talked about that connection between unraveling and renunciation, that we actually have to renounce things. <laughs> it's not just like, oh, no. Uh, so you you say you have this great little quote um, in the next chapter, the task before us now is not reform, but renunciation. Can you talk about what you mean by that yeah yeah um i i here i i need to acknowledge my debt to sister meg funk um a benedictine sister and uh just a brilliant teacher and and guide but she's really and uh she's working out of especially cat john cassian and so kind of pulling forward these thoughts of renunciation so um so Sister Meg is really significant for me there. But what I mean by that language of renunciation is that uh, is to, to give a kind of temporal quality, to attend to the, the temporality of human action. Not every action is possible at every moment in time. And I think at this moment in time, part of what we have to do is just to relinquish our hold, our kind of death grip on this older model yeah. where we're going to do everything that we can including like putting people into young people into debt for uh, you know the rest of their lives we're going to suck all of this out or do whatever we have to to sustain the present model we have to we have to relinquish our hold on that and part of that is a renunciation that is a kind of waiting with open hands for what god will do and it becomes an act of faith Instead of uh, proceeding with the confidence that we know at this time already uh, what needs to be done, um, I th- I think that waiting you can think of it like um, you can think of it like a fasting and waiting for a vision. You can think about it like the children of Israel uh, leaving Egypt before they really knew where they were going. They just knew they had to. Uh, leave the flesh pots of Egypt, right? And then we'll see what God does. Um, I think it's there in all the calls to the disciples. Um, there's a renunciation before there's a plan in a lot of ways. Uh, and I think uh, that's true even in our baptismal vows, where the first the first of the baptismal vows is a renunciation uh, of evil, of sin, of the power of sin and death over our lives. And then there's a turning to Christ. Uh, and then what, what a sanctified life, what a new life would look like starts on the other side. But there is that, that moment between renunciation and new life. And I think, I think we need to enter that moment. Oh, but that's so hard. I'm thinking it's, <laughs> it's really hard because I'm thinking, especially, you know, you mentioned kind of uh, your influence here kind of from the Benedictine. So the Protestants, don't do this well, I would say, like, sort of generally speaking, like that reflex to see reform as productive and to see waiting as passive. Yeah. Like we need to fix things because we are in crisis. Right. And and we're in charge. So, it, uh, we, I mean, this is all deep in the voluntary association kind of worldview. Um, so, yeah, I think it... Uh, it is. It is. It's a difficult ascesis. <laughs> There's no doubt. Um, but I think it's exactly that difficulty should um, uh, deli- help us see that it's not. Uh, it's not lazy or easy or you know passive. Any of those slurs that might be thrown at it. Just try it. Tell me how easy it is. Yeah, I think with. Um, I also think renunciation and reform. They they renunciation feeds into reform because if you if you sort of sure. jump into reform, 
right? What happens there is you might not actually be reforming the things like it, it, it's sort of uninformed or it can go with what yeah. your particular idea of what needs to be fixed is like for me. um, You know, I, I do work in this. Like, my space is in early Christianity. So I spend a lot of time with the ascetics. And one of the things that is particularly amazing to me is you, you have this idea of people that, you know, seemingly sit in a cave and do nothing. <laughs> Um, but that's not actually the case, right? It's, a, it's, it's actually a shaping of actually what is the whole trajectory of a person's life. And you can think about this on like a group level where we actually need to, that renunciation includes listening. Yeah. Um, not just, it includes listening to God, but it also is a, a space of radical honesty. Mm -hmm. Like what ha where have we actually sinned? Who are we actually hurting? What do we actually need to repent of? Because if we move into reform before we do that work, we can end up fixing things and leaving people out, actually bulldozing over people that actually needed to be heard. Um, the renunciation is is a deep work of the spirit. Um, yeah. And I was so I'm not used to seeing kind of space given to that work. And it it gave me some language there to see where a lot of our reactions in this space have been to skip that space. And so I appreciated that. Yeah. And, and I think what you see then are reforms that aren't really reforms, um, even if they involve extraordinary sacrifices, like um, selling your library or your air rights or your campus, or moving to an all adjunct faculty to radically cut costs so that you can continue uh, the exact same model of professional education. Yeah. Um, th this is not really a reform. This is a tweak in the business plan. Um, and it's not, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not the new thing, right? Um, and it's not going to be sustainable, I don't think. So we're going to take a, a brief breather before we talk about that, what the possibilities of that new thing could be and, and what that would be. So... Here's our speed round. <laughs> Are you All ready? Right, I'm so ready. So off the cuff. I don't know. Do not think too hard. So just whatever comes to mind first. Are you a morning or a night person? Morning. Amen. Uh, if you could compete as any professional athlete for the day, who would it be? Uh, any sport. Oh, I mean basketball for sure. Okay. Yeah. It's just it's just who I don't know. Maybe Jason Tatum these days. He's got a great game. Okay. All right. If you got a day to hang out with any theologian living or dead, who would it be? Benedict. What place in the world have you never been but would love to visit? Mexico City. What fictional family would you be a member of? Could be from a book, movie, TV show. Yeah, is this that I that like is most actually like my family? Or one that Interpret I Interpret as you will. Or that I would like to be <laughs> a member of. Um that's a really interesting question. Cormac McCarthy is on my mind right now because of uh his passing, but I I don't really want to be part of any of those families. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, there are profound, profound. Oh, well, I know. Um, I, I mean, I'd like to be, and and I often feel like I am, uh, by the grace of God, part of the family like um, Marilyn Robinson describes in the Gilead novels. Hey. What is the strangest question you've ever received from someone about theology? Uh one time I was preaching on Revelation and a woman uh, in a, this is a, not a wealthy rural community in upstate New York, an old woman in a floor length fur coat stood up and started walking down the aisle towards me as a preacher and uh, asking uh, how I would receive the bride of Christ. Okay. Do you know what she meant? I think she was convinced that she was the bride of Christ. Okay. And that I needed to think about how I would reckon with her presence. Wow. I've been asked about Ezekiel on airplanes, which I know nothing about, but <laughs> years, years is a lot. I mean, I don't mean to be too dramatic, but uh, no, that, 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 that's, that's the strangest theological question I've been asked. That, that would stick in one's mind. Yeah. Uh, What's one idea in theology you think needs to die? Oh, narratives of decline. Uh, what is the most recent work of fiction you've read that you just couldn't put down? Oh, um, 
Ben Lerner's The Topeka School. Uh, really, all of Ben Lerner's stuff I I love. Um, yeah. Teleportation or flying? Uh, I think teleportation. And our final one, what's the most significant book in theology in the last 50 years? Notice I said not one, it's, it's significance, not necessarily one you liked, but what's the most significant book? Last 50 years. I don't know that this is, that anyone will look back and think of the last 50 years as a golden age in theology, but uh, it's it's Cone, James Cone. Um, yeah. And I would probably, of of all of them, I would probably go with the cross and the lynching tree. If somebody would ask me that question, that's what I would also say. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, yeah, for many, many reasons. All right, speed round over. <laughs> well done. <laughs> it's really surprised me talking to theologians and asking them these questions, like how uh, how hard some of them can actually be in thinking of kind of off the cuff kind of answers. We're we're a synthetic thinking bunch. We like to <laughs> to work through our answers. So you move from talking about renunciations to affordances. So I want to start with a definition again. What are affordances? Yeah, I, um, here I'm borrowing from a phenomenological tradition, especially Merleau-Ponty and Dreyfus, uh, to think about. But I, but I'm but I then take it in a very theological sort of direction, and to say, affordances are what you see in a world illumined by the redeeming grace of God. So you see a world alive with these kinds of possibilities. One of the analogies that I use um, is to, they're, they're like the contours of a cliff face um, in that they are there. There's a there-ness to them. They have a distinctive shape, um, but they don't determine how you're going to use them. You might put your foot on them. You might grab them with your hand. You might push off them. You might pull on them. They're just the kind of contours of reality. And it takes a trained eye to see the different the 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 life of a cliff face, right? Otherwise, it just looks like a bunch of nothing, right? But if you have eyes to see, then you can see all the affordances in that space, and the, and then you can begin to think about different ways that they might be used. Um, and I'm wanting here to move away from language from like B school language of opportunities or resources, that kind of thing, because affordances, because of the way you know, the wily, paradoxical ways of redemption, affordances aren't always resources or things that are automatically good. They might be deeply ambivalent, right? Um, I I think, and the Bible is full of those kinds of things, right? Uh, for, for Joseph uh, and his brothers and so for all of the covenant people, a crazy pharaoh who will do anything to get his dreams interpreted becomes an affordance. You're not going to say this is desirable. Oh, I wish we had a crazy homicidal uh, pharaoh um, so that we would have that resource. No, but but in in the kind of work of redemption, the pharaoh becomes an affordance for how the people are saved. So I want to retain that ambivalence to the affordances, and I think that's essential uh, to any theological reading. So then that the final chapter is trying to describe some of the affordances that are there in an age of authentic individuals, that God has not left us bereft, uh, the, the world is not just this barren wasteland, but there are these things that we can grab hold of as we try to put together uh, life-giving communities. And you identify it, uh, that was really helpful. I think also, kind of sticking away from the resource language, we do tend to uh, monetize or um, we don't necessarily think kind of on the larger, you know, you might say powers and principalities kind of space. Yeah. <laughs> um, where using opportunities and resource makes it seem very, it's very limiting. Yeah. Um, uh, things before us. Affordances allows for kind of spirit of the age kind of stuff, as well as kind of what things you might interpret as a resource, like kind of all the whole scope of things. And you identify a few in our current context. Um, and the one you spend the most time on is this, the felt urgency of authenticity. As, and could you explain why this is an affordance and not an annoyance or hindrance or however else we might interpret it? 
Well, it can be an affordance and an annoyance and a hindrance and a, you know, uh, as I, I quote Adorno in the book, it's it's just <laughs> it's an ideological replication of the actual class position of somebody in late capitalism. Right? You've been rendered an individual, and so what uh, authenticity is is the kind of uh, ideological imagining of that individualized state. Um, I think that's true, um, and it's like uh, you know, having a "Don't Tread on Me" avatar. Uh, is actually pretty lousy compensation for being deeply integrated into a surveillance state uh, through social media. Uh, so, though, I, I, I don't. I want to register my ambivalence there about right. authenticity uh, as an ideal. With that said, um, I really appreciate your using the language that I use in the book of the felt urgency of authenticity. That. Yeah. We experience that need right now because we don't have a, a kind of network of voluntary associations to tell us who we are. So we are on our own, not only to fund our education or uh, pay for our health care or whatever, we're on our own to put together an identity. Um, now that, uh, so that that becomes, I think, a kind of affordance for theological education. It's one of the reasons why people come to theological schools, and they want it so much that they're willing to do a professional degree for a profession they have no desire to enter in order to do the work of self-making, right? Because that work feels so urgent to them. So that felt urgency, I think, is an affordance for theological education, not just for sustaining our institutions or continuing to pay our salaries, but it's but for the mission of theological education, right? To kind of realize that the depth of that desire that's out there. And if anything, the desire is more keen now. I, I, I see it in my kids. I see it in their friends um, because they just don't have this network of institutions telling them, giving them identities. They've got to build their own. Um, you know, and I think the the church has been very critical of that notion that that you're on your own, um, and that's, uh, you know, I I agree with those critiques on one level. Um, it's not the truth about us that we're on our own, but um, it's a kind of sociological fact in a narrow sense right now, and so what we have to do is to weave together uh, the kinds of institutions in a new way. Um, that are going to have a different grounding than the voluntary associations that were linked to a sacred national mission. These are going to we're going to have institutions and communities, but they're going to be centered on these kinds of expressive individuals um, who are putting lives together. And I don't think the expressive individual um, there there is an idolatrous element to that, no doubt. It's no more idolatrous than the nation state, though, and it's no more idolatrous than the crown and the very or the empire and the other things that have anchored social imaginaries. Uh, in the past. So I think Christians are always navigating with the orders of this world, right? And it's just to say the order of the world now is built around these individuals who are desiring authenticity above all things. Um, and so we have to figure out what it means to be gospel people in that space. I think about you know being gospel people and how we have the companion of the Holy Spirit. Mm. Um, you know, my background is Pentecostal, <laughs> um, and that sense that we are never alone um, in our our formation as Christians, that the Spirit is always testifying to and uniting us to Christ, mm. um, and that God will never leave us or forsake us, and that yes. the Spirit is also forming us as community. Um, whatever that looks like. And the spirit is so delightfully like <laughs> doing new things, connecting new to old, like really like it's almost like Im imagination, <laughs> like the space of the spirit where the spirit just sort of plays in that space. And there's almost a delight by God to like connect things together that would seem like coincidences, but then just sort of ah, like fit. And I just think about how the spirit is you know behold i am doing a new thing like where where are those connections where are those spaces where we see ourselves coming together and seeing how we are connected with one another and where we can say oh you too have the spirit <laughs> um and between us there's something happening 
Um, and what is that something? Um, and what is being formed? And um, I, I hope that we do the work that you talk about of renunciation so that we can have the space to see what the spirit is doing and to get on that train, <laughs> what, wherever it goes and whatever it does and where the gospel becomes real to us in our space and in our time in a new way. What a delight it was to talk with you, Ted. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thanks, Amy. I enjoyed it too. And I'm deeply grateful for the care and uh, enthusiasm with which you read my book. Thank you. Oh, well, it was, it, it, it deserves it. It was uh, an amazing experience. Thank you for writing it. This is your host, Amy Hughes with OnScript. We've been enjoying a conversation today with Ted Smith, the Charles Howard Candler Professor of Divinity and Associate Dean of Faculty at Emory's Candler School of Theology. Ted's book, The End of Theological Education, is published by Ertmans. You can find links to the books on our website, onscript.study. Thank you for joining me today, friends. You have been listening to OnScript, delectable conversations on scripture and theology. If this episode has brought you inner peace or lit your biblical fire, please consider a small donation of just two or five dollars per month. Information on how to donate can be found at onscript.study/donate.